Why is it not recording? Okay, now we're recording. Good. And I'll say, like, I love questions like this because these are the sorts of questions. I mean, you can math your way out of this. It is possible, right? Like if you chose an interest rate and wanted to actually determine the present values of all of these things, you could math your way out of this. But what I'm trying to do when I ask you this question is I'm trying to gauge, intuitively do understand what's going on, right? I call these light bulb questions. The reason for that is, is complicated, but these are called light bulb questions for me. And you just basically, if you understand what you're doing, it's pretty quick to answer. And if you don't understand what you're doing, it's very hard to BS your answer. Okay, and if you honestly have no idea how to answer this question, I'm fine if you want to try and math it. Okay, and the way that you would math it is again, choose an interest rate, compound. It doesn't matter how often you compound, try and maybe do weekly or monthly or daily or something. Choose an interest rate, whatever interest rate you want, it doesn't matter, and compute the present value of these four things. Okay, and that's how you would math this, but you can do it just by looking at it. Hmm. The pools are very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, we're at about 73%. I'm going to give you all about 20, 30 more seconds here. Get your answers in. We'll see how this looks. Okay. All right, I'm going to end it. Oh, oh, a bunch of last minute ones came in. Beautiful. Okay, let's take a look at this. So uh, half the class answered A, a quarter of the class answered D, and then the rest, the other 25% or so, scattered amongst B and C. So A sort of is the overwhelming majority here. I'm going to tell you, A is not correct. Um, so I mean, maybe some of you misinterpreted the question. And we're gonna, we'll reassess this in a second, but it's not just what you would pick from like a personal viewpoint, what would you pick from a financial viewpoint? Like which of these options has the best present value? Okay. Yeah, that's okay, right? Jack, it, like they're not, they're not worth marks. Who cares if you accidentally hit the wrong thing? Um, so again, let me kind of say this and then I'm gonna reopen the polls. Uh, what you're trying to do is figure out as of say September 1st, right, which of these four options has the largest present value. I'm going to tell you that A is not it. Okay, so let's try that again. Let's see. I'm not going to give you as long to vote this time because you've had some time to think about it, but let's see if you can get it. Okay, interesting. All right, we're, I'm going to learn something here. I'm going to learn something. I love it.
Okay, we're already at 70%, so give it about 20 more seconds. Yeah, the largest present value. Which of these four options has the largest present value? Really, just the largest value ever, period. It doesn't matter if you want to push them all to the end of December and see which one of this, them is worth more. You could do that as well. You'll get the same answer. All right, class. So you now overwhelmingly said D, which is also not correct. So uh, there is, uh, yeah. So let's figure out what's going on. <laughs> well, okay, now it's 50-50. So a bunch of you are saying B and a bunch of you are saying C and nobody knows <laughs> what the answer is. Okay, okay, let, let, let me explain it. And let's see. <laughs> I love it. I love when the chat just exp explodes because how could... <laughs> okay. What happens, everyone, let's think about it like this. What happens the further away? Like, okay, let, let's look at option D here. If I were to bring D to the present, let's say, let's say right now it's September 1st. If I bring D to the present, is it worth more than $200 or less than $200? Okay, right? Okay, a bunch of people are saying less. Uh, and less is correct, right? This is the time value of money. Uh, yeah, market rates are constant, but it doesn't change the fact that money today is worth more to me than money in the future, right? So for example, if I said, hey, what if I'm going to give you $200 10,000 years from now? You'd be like, well, that's useless. I don't want to engage in this deal. I'll be dead, right? You'd rather have $200 today. I'm going to, we're, we're going to figure out what the right answer is in a second. But same sort of thing. What if I said I was going to give you $200 30 years from now between inflation and the lost opportunity cost of being able to invest that money, you would still rather have $200 today than, than in 30 years, right? So money today is more valuable than money in the future. So when we pull money back through time, it picks up a discount, right? It actually gets, it's worth less. So the further away it is, the less it's worth. So D is actually the least of these three options, right? Because you got all of your money, all $200 in December, which means all of that money is severely discounted because it's so far away from actually realizing it, right? So even though you all chose D uh, this time, D is actually the worst option for you to choose, okay? So on the basis of this, now that we know it's between B and C, which of B and C is better? Okay, so I think the majority of the class is saying C with a couple of people in Bs. Jacob, stop spamming the chat, don't do that. <laughs> I, I like it, I like the playfulness, but no, no, I know you're just having fun, right? But uh, <laughs> don't, just have a, half the fun, okay? Have half that amount of fun. Um, <laughs> So C, C is the best, everyone. And the reason is, is because between these two options, C gives you money sooner, right? C and B are the same. They're both gonna give you $200 payments, but C is giving you money sooner. Does that make sense? The sooner you get your money, the best. What would be the best option? The best option isn't up here, but what is the best option? Somebody just write out what the best thing that could happen would be. Exactly, 200 up front, right? So Daniel, exactly. Everything right now is the best possible option. Now, we deliberately did not include that. D is the worst option, right? Because, and, and think about it. If you guys were all trying to pay for your textbooks and we said, listen, I'm going to give you $200 in December, you'd say, this sucks. I can't buy any of my books until December, right? That's garbage. That doesn't do you any good. So C is the best answer because it's the answer that gives you the most amount of money up front, right? Uh, if you look at C versus B, by the end of October, you have $100 in both cases, but in C, you got the $100 sooner than in B. Same thing with A. With A, you did get your $100 uh, at the end of October, but you only got $50 in September and $50 in October versus C, where you got $100 right away, right? Well, listen, if I ever become a, a, like 30, if I'm ever worth $30 billion, Jeremiah, I'll track you down. I'll give you that $200 million, okay? But like, probably it won't happen. 
Uh, and so you, also you should save this chat, otherwise you won't have any uh, evidence that such a verbal arrangement was made. <laughs> um, so does everyone, does that make sense, everyone? Do you understand why C is the, the correct answer here, right? The, the question is, what, which of these gives you the most money as soon as possible? And for which the answer for that is C, okay? <laughs> okay, now, I want you all as an exercise to try and math it out. Okay, so assume it's September 1st, let's, you know, if you want to choose numbers, choose, you know, uh, an interest rate of 4% a month, compounding monthly, and then compute the present value of each of these four options and see which of these is bigger, and you'll see that the answer is C. Okay, and in particular, because that $100 payment at the end of September has the least, basically, it's because that $100 payment at the end of September has the least number of discounts applied to it. All right, so give that a shot if you want. That'd be a kind of a cool little thing that you could do and you could you know see if that actually works out for you so i don't think there's any math to do there so i'm not gonna you know write anything out um let's do this one i yeah see if it works out like but but do it yourself because i think it would be great exercise and then post on piazza if you're not certain how to do it um but i think i think that's a really fun exercise i'm gonna warn you all as well now this is another one that you can math out right? If you choose an interest rate R and compute the annual and uh, compounding effective rates, you can just figure out what the answer is. But it is possible to do this answer, to, to figure out the answer to this uh, without doing any computation. And I know there's an E. Uh, okay, you know what? Actually, let me show it down. I think I do have an E poll. I'm sorry for those of you who voted. Um, what do I want to do? Stop the poll. Poll five. Okay, I do actually have a poll with five answers. Look at that. There you go. Operation. Yeah, I can't believe I have one. By the way, everyone, what I want to mention here too is there's this, ah, what, what's the effect of annual and continuous, right? That's a great question. So you'll want to make sure that you check out the videos for this because they talk about them. But uh, in a nutshell, the effective annual rate is the rate at which if you only compounded once a year, you would get the same amount as, of money as whatever your the APR scheme is. And the continuous effective rate is the same thing, but you compounded continuously. So, you know, let's say that you have an APR of R percent compounding monthly, the effective annual rate is uh, the rate at which you would need to get the same amount of money if you only compounded once. And uh, the continuous effective rate is the rate you would need to compound at if you compounded continuously, but still wanted the same amount of money. So that's what those things are. So what I want to say, though, is there's this thing that happens, which is, and I'm certain many of you have seen this before, where you're, you know, you're taking up a question with the professor or the TA or whatever the case might be, and everything makes perfect sense. And then you walk away, and 10 minutes later, you have no idea how to do the problem, right? It's like somehow your understanding was like related to your physical proximity to me or something, right? So what uh what happens right exactly and i think you guys you know what i you know what i'm talking about i've had it i've experienced that right that, like you know your instructor explains it you're like yes it makes sense you go off you try and do it on your own nothing makes sense anymore now part of that is what you <laughs> part of that what you want to do is you want to reaffirm your understanding as soon as you have it okay so with the previous slide once you've answered this question what i want you to do is go back to the previous slide and write down your understanding in your own words, okay? Like, why was option C the best option there? And that action of writing that down in your own words is gonna reaffirm that idea in your brain and make it less likely to slip away 10 minutes from now, okay? So make sure that you do that. Same sort of thing, when we're done this question, we're gonna talk about it, and hopefully I do a good enough job that you're like, ah, yes, I understand what's going on. But if you then just immediately transition into the next question, 
what you'll find is that by the end of class, you won't remember what the explanation for this question is, right? So you'll just want to, and even if it's just a couple of notes, just take a couple of notes to remind yourself what was the main idea there, even so that if you have to reconstruct it, you can on your own, um, but just make sure that you're writing something down so that you can reaffirm that idea in your brains, okay? And that will help a little bit with this, uh, this fact that as you become physically and temporally more distant from me and us doing the question that you have a tendency to forget. So that will mitigate that. Okay, so we're at two thirds uh, participated. Let's uh, do another 30 seconds or so, see if we can get that in. <clears throat> All right, so we're about 80%, which is close enough for me. Let's share those results, almost uniform. Right, uh, which goes to which says that probably the class has no idea. So this one we should take up, and we might need a couple of explanations in order to be able to do this one. And this one's okay, but again, this is one of my favorite problems. I really do love this problem. So let's see what's going on here. Okay, so we've got. Let me just pull up the question so I can see it. All right. So we've got an APR of R compounding monthly. All right, so this is question, oh, red is a bad color. So this is question six. So we have an APR of R percent compounding monthly. Uh, R sub A is the effective annual rate. R sub C is the effective continuous rate. All right, now actually, you know, we did a question like this in office hours on Tuesday. So for those of you who were there, uh, you probably remember that. Okay, so we have got the effective annual rate, we've got the effective continuous rate. Uh, let me ask you the following. So, uh, and I'm going to do this the same way as we did in office hours on Tuesday. So for those of you who were there for that, you might be like, oh, okay, whatever. I, I, I've seen this before. The more we compound the, does, does the amount of money we get increase or decrease? So do we get more money as we compound more or do we get less money? Right? Yeah. Okay. So we get more money, right? That was kind of like the lesson that we learned. The more we compound, the more money we get, right? So generally, the more that we compound, the more money we earn. All right. So the annual rate says, so if we compound annually, that's only once per year, right? The question says that you're given an APR compounding monthly. And then the continuous rate is you're compounding continuously. OK. So if you had to tell me, if I use the same number for all three of these, like let's say I used 4%, 4% annually, 4% monthly, and 4% continuously, which of these would earn the most money? Okay, right, so this is the most right here. Okay, what's the second most? Monthly, good, so this is the second most. Okay, and last is annually, right? Exactly, okay, this is anticipating what I was gonna say next, annually like that. Okay, so and annually is the worst. Maybe I should say worst. Okay, what is the difference between continuous and monthly? So continuous is that you're compounding at literally every moment of time. You're compounding more than once a second. You're compounding more than once a millisecond. You're compounding more than, no, like at every instant of time, faster than every nanosecond, faster, more than, faster than every second. 
It can't, it can't physically happen. Nothing compounds continuously. It's just a theoretical model, but it's a very handy and common theoretical model uh, that is used a lot in finance. Uh, and especially I've seen it in the pricing of like, like things like derivatives and options. Right, okay, this is a great question. Why are we studying it if it's not real? So the reason that we do it is because the math is easier if you use continuous compounding interest, okay? And the whole point of the effective continuous rate is that you can use, you can make it so that the continuous model is really, really close to the, to the discrete model where you like compound monthly. But when you need to start doing really complicated math, having the continuous model is just strictly easier to work with. So what some people will do is say, and if you've, you've like looked at the videos and looked at the, the textbook, you know that as you continue like compound more and more often, the gap between the gap gets smaller, right? Compounding every day versus compounding every second doesn't really make a big difference, right? We learn that. And so compounding every second versus every millisecond makes even less of a difference. And then every millisecond versus every, you know, picosecond is almost no difference. So compounding continuously, we can get a really good approximation to the solution, but make our math a lot easier, okay? And so that's why we study continuous compounding interest. All right, now, this isn't the answer to the question yet, because with the effective annual rate, what you're saying is whatever the effective annual rate is, after one year, you have this much money, okay? With the monthly, you have this much money after one year, and with the continuous rate, you have this much money after one year, okay? Now, if all three, if RA was equal to RM was equal to RC, then we would write this. Does everyone agree? Right, that's what we were saying when we said most, second most, and worst. We were saying if all four of these numbers are the same, if RA was four, R, or 0.04, if RM was 0.04, and RC was 0.04, then this, uh, these inequalities would be true. Does that make sense? Okay. But the definition of R sub A is that this has to be true. And the definition of continuous compounding interest is that this is true. So let's just look, ignore continuous for a second. Let's look at this. If the continuous, okay, yeah, I think we're starting to see some ahas. If the continuous grows slower, but has to be equal to the thing on the right, does the rate have to be bigger or lower than R sub M, right? So this grows slower. It grows slower, but has to give you the same amount of money. Does RA have to be bigger than R sub M or smaller than R sub M? It's gotta be bigger, right? You remember, in fact, uh, so two, why are they equal? That's the definition of RA. R sub A says it is the rate such that these two are equal. Okay, so that's why these have to be equal. And in fact, this should look a lot like your numeracy question from assignment one, right? Do you remember one plus X to the power of something, one plus R to the power of something, which is bigger, X or R? It's the same sort of thing, right? So R sub A must be bigger than the monthly rate. Is everyone, are there questions about this? Is everyone okay, right? Because this grows slower, it needs to use a higher interest rate to be equal to the thing in the middle. And that's the idea there. Is that okay? Okay. Now, let's look at this one. The continuous thing, uh, so the interest rate has to be bigger, not the compound. Right, exactly, right. So Curdy, the compounding uh, frequency is already fixed, right? So the only thing we can change is, the, is the, the rate. So the continuous thing grows faster than the monthly thing, but they have to be equal. So is the continuous rate bigger or smaller than the monthly rate? Exactly, it's smaller, very good. And so now we're done, right? R sub A is greater than R sub M is greater than R sub C. That was B.
Okay. Now, it's possible to do this mathematically as well. Uh, let me show you. So we know that the formula for the annual effective rate is this. Uh, what is it? It's one plus, in our case, this. Okay. And the effective continuous rate is 12 on, actually, you know what? Let me leave the 12 inside. is this, okay? And so what we could do is let's just say let x equal one plus r sub m over 12 to the power of 12. The question now is uh, here we have r sub a equals x minus one, and we have r sub c is ln x, uh, which is bigger, ln x or x minus one. Now, you might not know this, but the answer is ln x is, or sorry, ln x is, is smaller. Okay. And this proof is very easy with calculus. We don't have this yet, but ln x as a function is always less than or equal to x minus one. Okay. With them being equal when x is equal to one. And in fact, uh, we can go further and we can say this is true. Okay. Where did the ln come from? OK, so you'll want to go back and you'll want to look at your effective continuous rate. But basically, if we know that e to the rc is equal to 1 plus rm over 12 to the power of 12, right? That was the equation that we had above. Sure. I mean, yeah, actually, here, let me do this. So Jacob, you remember, so this equation, if you solve this equation for r sub c, then you uh, you would just take the lawn of both sides, right? And that's where the lawn comes from. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, sorry, x should not be less than x minus one. That doesn't make sense. Let's just write it like that. I mean, this is, this is how lawn works, right? Lawn of e to the rc is equal to r sub c. And so when you take the lawn of the other side, you're you're done, All right? So the R sub C brings that down. How do we use the effective continuous rate? Does the problem tell you? It probably will. Yeah, it depends. Uh, we'll see an example. Actually, your next assignment will have an example. Your next assignment is actually currently posted, but your next assignment uh, will tell you um, exactly, we'll, we'll do an example of having an effective continuous rate, right? Why are we doing this again? It depends on what you're asking. So uh, here, let me show you the following. Uh, uh, I think I prepped this. OK. Um, so what we have here are graphs, actually, of here, let me set t to be 12. So the interest rate is, or the compounding period is 12. So this top thing here, this curve, this is the uh, effective uh, annual rate. OK, uh, and what I've plotted it here against is the uh, interest rate. OK, so the x axis here is whatever your interest rate is. And then the y axis is the effective annual rate. And then uh, this curve, what is that purple? Is that purple? That this bottom curve is the effective continuous rate. And so you can see that you know, this blue curve is always above this purpley curve. Does that make sense? Does everyone see that? So mathematically, you can actually see that this is true. Okay, makes sense. Is everyone okay with this? I personally, though, the math of this is uh, actually not my preferred way of doing it. I definitely prefer to do this in the uh, this way, where we where we say, oh, the annual thing is decrease is increasing the slowest. And the continuous thing is increasing the fastest. And so the rates have to balance out. Again, I love it because this is a case where the finance actually tells us something about the math, right? That we can use finance to answer a math question, which I think is cool. Uh, yes. Yeah. And this is part of what I'm trying to explain. Like, if I asked you this exact question on a test, I mean, I haven't written any words here because I'm saying it to you verbally. But if you explained this in words, as far as I'm concerned, it's a perfect solution, right? 
the annual thing grows the slowest, so therefore it needs a higher interest rate. The continuous thing grows the fastest, so it actually has to have a slower interest rate. Therefore, R sub A is greater than R sub M is greater than R sub C. Boom, 100% solution there, right? That says to me that you have a great understanding of what it is that you're doing. Um, and yeah, that's, a, that's full marks, 100%. Okay. All right. Let's see a different question. I've got a couple more of these, but let's do, oh, geez. Let's do something a little bit different. Oh, okay. Here's, here's one that's very closely related to what we just did. Oh, I don't want to do the four, five pull anymore. We're going to go back to the four pull. So this, this problem is actually backwards than how it works in real life. In real life, you would use compounding to approximate the discrete, not the other way around. But that's OK. And in case it's not clear here, everyone, they're not using the effective continuous rate here. They're using the same 2% rate, right? Or so they're not using uh, an effective rate. They're just using 2% in both cases. So this is directly related to what we just talked about. Uh, uh, yes, for when they actually compute uh, every, what do we say, minute? Uh, yes, then that is an APR. You're right, that should probably say APR in there, but good catch. And if those of you want to see like a real life uh, example of where continuous compounding interest is used. So again, if you pick up like Hall's book on financial derivatives, it's everywhere in there. Um, but if you want one from our class that we probably won't cover, but is in the notes, you can check out section 4.4.4, which tells you how to do options pricing, uh, you know, not using black shoals, but it tells you how to do option pricing. So that's on page 127 of the PDF if you want to do it. And you will see the use of the exponential function to model the growth. Uh, and the exponential function makes a big difference here. It makes it significantly easier to solve. And this is a real model. Like this is actually uh, a very reasonable way of doing options pricing. It's funny that you say that because I was asked about that once in an interview, a job interview. About what? Specifically this? Well, the Black-Scholes model, but generally the same logic. Right. Uh, yeah. So. Um, what do they ask you about Black-Scholes? 
So it was for a capital markets position and uh, they wanted to see if you actually knew what the black shows is and what measures and what were the restrictions of it in general, so. Interesting. But like, was there an expectation that you would work with black shows? Uh, potentially, down, uh, if you went down the road, then yes, for sure. But uh, mm-hmm. not at first. At first, I just wanted to make sure that you kind of understand at right. least the general aspect of it. I mean, like, it's a stochastic differential equation, right? Like, those are nasty. <laughs> you can tell me about it. Um, we worked with them a little bit. Then, like, uh, there's a fourth year finance course, which is called Derivatives and Options. Mm-hmm. That's actually what the whole course is about. And uh, there's a whole chapter on this like, topic. Alone. Okay. Okay, nice. 30 seconds, everyone, and then I'm going to lock up the polls. I remember when, like, you know, when we were finishing our PhDs, a bunch of people were thinking about entering finance. So we started doing, like, readings on derivatives and options. And I remember being so frustrated with the book because the book assumed you didn't know any math. And, <laughs> like, if you knew math, it was so easy, right? Like, computing optimal hedge ratios, it was just like, yeah, man, this is, you're optimizing the standard deviation. Like, differentiate the standard deviation, set it equal to zero, boom, you're done. Um, but it was like, we're going to assume that you're too afraid of calculus to do this. So we're going to spend like 15 pages setting this up. It's exactly that. That's why a lot of these jobs take math PhDs directly into finance roles without like any prereqs. Because you can yeah. learn the finance aspect a lot exactly. easier than you know, the math aspect behind exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, okay. So uh, B seems to be the big answer here. And absolutely, yeah, B is correct. Um, because what we just said is that continuous compounding interest grows faster than the discrete version, right? Uh, R is the discrete version, C is continuous compounding interest, so C is bigger than R, right? And again, work it out. If you really, really want to, you can, you can actually do the math of this. Um, did we say how long we were gonna do it? Try to assess the value for a year, right? So if you want, like you can actually just work out the numbers, but again, intuitively, you just know what the answer is going to be. Um, so, uh, let me just pull up the question here. So you've got a continuous investing, uh, thing at 2%. So E.002, and then you're going to also invest every minute. 525,600 divided by 525,600. And you just compute these things and see which of them is bigger. Oh, Kayla, it doesn't matter. So Kayla, if you know if you knew which one was bigger and you just got your numbers reversed, you you still answered it correctly. Uh, so it doesn't matter, right? Because you know uh, that you got the answer right. Even if the the thing you put in, like you, you, you hit C instead of B, who cares, right? You know you got the answer right. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter what actually shows up on the thing. Okay, so does that make sense? Like just literally just compute these two things and you should get that this one is bigger. All right, let me, let me give you a little bit of a computation question. I realize so far, a lot of kind of what we've done has been kind of just thinking about it, not really doing any math. And maybe that's, you know, maybe some of you are like, no, I want to do some math. In which case, I, who am I to tell you no? Uh, so here we go. Why don't we do this? Okay, no, no, Jacob, 100%. Let's talk about this. You're confused? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. So the question says, question says that you've got uh, 2% compounding continuously for one year, right? It doesn't tell you what the principle is, but that's because the principle doesn't matter. Um, but if you want, let's include it and let's see. So let's say we invest in a principle P. So the amount of money that I would get after one year of compounding at 2% continuously is P E to the 0.02. Okay, and you can, you can just check this. Um, like this is the definition of how continuous compounding interest works. Uh, now, if we did uh, 2% APR minutely, which is a weird word, APR minutely, right? Then how do we compute that? We would do one plus the interest rate divided by the number of compounding periods. like that. Uh, and then we're just, you compute with these, you notice how it doesn't matter what P is because P kind of shows up in both cases, but you know, whatever, go through and, and work it out. And you know what, let me work this out for you, for you very quickly. 
when are lecture uh, uploaded? Often by sometimes the same day, but sometimes it's not until the next day. So this is 1.02020 dot, dot, dot. And then the other one is, or it's P times that, but whatever. Yeah, in this case, you could have plugged in a P, but basically what you could have said is, why not let P just be $1? Right, like let's see which of these dollars grows faster and it works out to be the same thing. All right, 525,600. Oh man, they're so close though. Uh, so this is why we use our brains though instead. Zero to uh, zero. Okay, I need more significant digits because they're so close to being one another. Uh, that kind of comes to your point as well that you mentioned earlier when you're like when you're comp like compounding the difference between minutely and continuously becomes smaller than when you look at the bigger numbers yeah because the difference is fine very finite one three four so here's where the first here's the first change right like they're so close to being equal that and and, and so again this was a great question for somebody who's like well, why would we ever use co continuous compounding interest if it's not realistic? Well, look at how many significant digits I had to use in order to get a difference between something which compounded discreetly and something which compounded continuously. I might as well use continuous compounding interest. Look how easy this thing is to compute versus this mess, right? Like, so it really becomes the point where, uh, especially if you're compounding very frequently, continuous compounding interest effectively does the job for you don't make your life harder, right? So for those of you who are kind of like wondering why would we do this, that's why we do it, okay? So does this, does this clear some stuff up? How can we explain this language with a uh, situation with language instead of calculation? As you compound more, you earn more money, right? And nothing compounds faster than continuous compounding, right? Compounding continuously is compounding at literally every instant of time. And yeah, absolutely, Brandon. E is definitely uh, the superior number, right? Uh, and Jeremiah, yes, absolutely. You could just say continuously compounding is must be bigger. Uh, and so because they use the same interest rate, it is the biggest one. And that is 100% a, a, a fine and exceptional explanation. OK, does this, does, does this make sense? Could, wait, okay, could you upload last lecture's recording earlier? Is, did I not upload the last lecture? I'm pretty sure I did. Let me just check that real quick. I mean, we're basically at the end of class. I do have another one I want to do if, if everyone's willing to hang out. I know you're free because this is our two hour lecture. So you can't say like you have something else to go to. Um, <laughs> oh, you know what? I haven't uploaded it. You're right, Rafid. Let me, uh, you know what? I'll try and do that almost as soon as we're done lecture today, okay? Uh, let's do, I, I want to do one more. Again, if you, this is technically office hours. If you don't want to hang out, you don't have to. Uh, I want to do this one though. I think it's going to be really great practice. So I hope you know you'll be willing to hang out and do this one with me. Um, so let's do this one. Actually, this is this is bugging me. There's something wrong with this. Uh, the answer, the correct answer, isn't here. As far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, so work it out. Do, this is now an open-ended problem. We're not doing, we're not doing polls anymore because the correct answer is not in there. Um, Twenty-six, twenty-four. Right. So four. Uh, 
If it was 26 years, the right answer would be there. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I get I get what's up. Because okay. nine nine R or twenty six R is after nine years or twenty six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it. Got it. All right. So everyone, I'm gonna give you uh probably another two or three minutes. Right. And this is what I'm saying. The answer is here if you we made a mistake here. Um so I'm gonna show you, I will work it out. But do I'm going to give you a couple more minutes to actually work out what the answer is, and then we'll do it. And if it does turn out that the answer is here, then I'll eat my words and say, sorry, the answer is in here. Um, but by my recollection, it's actually not. Now that I think about it, we, we were being cocky. It's not in here. Sure, Brandon, sure, send it to me. Rafid, close. Again, you wanna be careful because if you've done e to the power of 10, that was just 10 years at an interest rate of R times S times T. And that's a little bit different. Close, Brandon, very close. It's the right idea. First of all, note though that your, your numbers don't add up to 26. It just, it doesn't, I mean, so, even in our screw up, A is not the correct answer. You have to be careful about, like why would it be addition is the question? Right? Okay, so uh, yeah. yeah, so exactly. B would be the right answer if this made sense monthly, but it doesn't. So I'm gonna show you uh, how to do this correctly. And then I'm gonna show you why we screwed up. Um, I can't believe we didn't catch this, this is crazy. And then I caught it in lecture. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So remember, P E to the R N, this is how much a principal grows at a continuous compounding rate, compounding continuously. Maybe, let me just put the question in here so that my notes are a little bit more organized, All right? So what is this? This is question 10. Okay, so this is compounding continuously at the rate R for N years. Okay, uh, maybe, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. So in one year, uh, we'll, we take our compounding uh, interest. Now for one month, we compound at a rate of uh, R. So if I only wanted to figure out how much money I had earned after the first month, what would it be? So let's just do the first month. How many months have passed in a year? Right, it's one over 12, perfect, exactly. Right? Does everyone understand why n is equal to 1 over 12? Because only 1 12th of a year have passed, right? So we did e to the r over 12. Okay, now we take this sum of money and we start to compound at the interest rate s, but we only do it for a month. So what am I going to then multiply this by? Right, e to the s, yeah, exactly, e to the s over 12, perfect. And then the next month, you can probably guess, we're gonna do e to the t over 12, right? Okay, so this is what happens 
This is a three month block, right? And if we want, we can, we can make this a little, we can write this down a little bit nicer. We could write this as e to the 1 12th r plus s plus t, right? Because when we multiply exponents, they add in the exponent. Okay, so in one year now, I'm going to do that four more times. So after one year, so this is a three month period. So after one year, what do we get? What should the exponent be? Don't worry about the e part. What should the exponent be? So we're going to get p e to the what? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So p, so not just e to the four though, right? Because that's like that's a crazy big number. Uh, right. So yeah, we're going to multiply. We're going to take that whole number to the power of four. Is that what you, maybe that's what you all meant? Like we're going to do this, and then that would also agree with Safe and and Rafid. What you guys have uh, written down, right? So if we raise this to the power of four. Then we get p e to the. Remember now, when you multi, when you exponentiate an exponent, you multiply the exponents, and exactly that will give us p e to the r plus s plus t uh, times one third. Okay. So now we're going to do it for what is it? Twenty six months. So that's two years and two months, right? So let's figure out after two years what should it be. We're going to get P E to the. So we're going to do this for another year. Anyone? Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, two thirds. R plus S plus T. And now I need to add in the last two months, right? So let's add in the last two months. So adding the last two months. So we get two thirds R plus S plus T. And then we get E to the R over 12, E to the S over 12. And if we add all that together, we're going to e to the, probably actually should have kept them as a fraction over 12, right? Maybe let me rewrite this as 8 twelfths, right? Um, so what is that going to be? So that's going to be 9 twelfths r plus 9 twelfths s plus 8 twelfths t, OK? Um, uh, a lot of people don't know how you got the 2 over 3. But it's just multiplied by two because after one year it was a third. Right. After two years it'll be two thirds. Yeah. Here, let me let me. Uh, there's a couple of ways we could do it, but what we could do is say, okay, yeah. After one year, we had this exponent, uh, one third r plus s plus t, and then so after two years, I'll have this much, right? And so I multiply the two in. Right. Or if you redid that whole process. Uh, you know, you can do it again. And exactly, I just, I, I use the 12th denominator just to make the addition easy. I don't, I don't think so, Josefa. I mean, you can try it, like choose numbers for R, S, and T, but I don't think that's going to work out to be the same answer. Because in particular, when you multiply interest rates, you get a really small interest rate, right? Um, because think about it, if you multiply like 0.04 times 0.01 times 0.02, your interest rate ends up being like 0 0.000006 or something, right? Uh, so it becomes very, very small. Okay, so yeah, so there's a couple of, of things I want to take up here. So does everyone see why we, act, why we were being dumb? And so we kind of thought the correct answer was B, but we forgot to divide by 12 because we were kind of pretending that every month would pick up a factor of e to the r instead of e to the r over 12. So that's why we screwed up. And, and the correct answer here is b if we'd remembered to divide everything by 12. OK, so that's where that's going. Now, questions. Why don't you do e to the t over 12? Oh, uh, did somebody answer that? Yeah, Aziz answered that, because we stop after 26 months, right? So two years is 24 months. And then we do the 25th and the 26th month. So that's R and, and S, but not T. Why did we multiply instead of adding? Same reason. What if it wasn't continuous? We would have done this. Right? We're multiply. 
And so when we do continuous, we do the same thing uh, and we're still gonna multiply, right? We don't wanna add. Uh, it's just that instead of using this thing, we're gonna use the exponential. So does that, does that make sense? Okay, perfect. Um, can I explain how I got eight twelfths? Sure. I like, okay, let me kind of go back here and rewrite everything, keeping it as just twelfths, because I think it should have just stayed as twelfths everywhere. And that just because, you know, it would have been easier when we did it at the end. So if you look at kind of how we, how we track everything, you know, we got one twelfth after three months. And then to figure it out for the whole year, we multiplied everything by four, right? So that gave us four twelfths for a single year. Then after two years, we squared it. And then, so that multiplies the four by two, and that gives us eight twelfths. And then uh, we added on the final two months, which just made the R and the S go up by one. Um, can you go back to the questions? I just want to read something in the question with the word in sure. your question. Yeah. All right, we forgot the over 12. So the answer here, everyone, if you see, the answer was supposed to be B, but we forgot to put the one over 12 in it. I mean, Aziz is the person to ask that question. Uh, is there a tutorial where we get to ask these type of questions? Um, so in the tutorial, we have a lot of good questions, like a lot of also like both uh, computation and arbitrary questions that we like done. Um, I don't think we had a question exactly like this, but we had a lot of also really good questions that are similar in terms of logic. Yeah, okay, so everyone, uh, that's gonna take care of us today. There's, there are like, you know, there's another question, for example, but it's, you know, an effective annual rates question. Um, and so we'll go on to office hours now. For those of you who, uh, again, don't wanna hang out, maybe wanna take this time to practice some uh, other stuff, by all means, go ahead and do it. Are there things other than tutorials which can help us? I mean, there's still a ton of, so uh, Connie, I do see your question, just let me write it down. Uh, while well, you write it down, I can answer that. Uh, what we do in tutorials, I would like, I would say, is very helpful because we take concepts that you guys do in lectures and we kind of drill down them a bit more and make sure you guys actually understand how to look at them from different perspectives. And if you just go to, I have a, like a few tutorials on uh, Tuesday. There's a few tutorials on Thursday as well. If you try going to any of them, you usually do the same pool of questions anyways. You'll see how useful they can get, and uh, you can be the judge for yourself. All right, let me pull up this question. And then Jacob, of course you can. Uh, okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. Normally, again, we take a little break. Um, and, and then let me just kind of finish by adding to this as well. Like, you know, there's tons of exercises in the back of the book. Uh, even better, everyone, I can't uh, describe how important this is. Try making your own. Okay, try making your own questions. And then if you're having trouble struggling or, or like if you can make a question and answer it, that's phenomenal, right? Uh, if you can make a question and then give it to one of your classmates and then they do the same thing for you, that's also phenomenal. And if you have trouble figuring out like whether something is appropriate or how to solve such a question, come on Piazza. Like I think for those of you who have been on Piazza, you know we're pretty good at responding, right? Like I think we respond pretty quickly. Um, so those are all also resources that you can use. And yeah, use tutorials and office hours and all that as much as you can. Uh, let me take about a five minute break here. Um, again, just to you know, refill my water bottle and stuff. And then we'll come back and I'll, I will do some office hours. Um, and then, yeah, so Connie, I've seen your question. So we'll take up to 28. Uh, and then, yeah, for everyone else, if you have questions, we'll, we'll come back and do it. Okay, so five minutes by my watch, that's about 620. Uh, and we'll resume then.